Greetings everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. Today, we will be doing something different. I reached out to the members of Back to Ashes and asked them to pick their favorite genre to listen to. Well, they sure understood the assignment because I have a compilation video coming for you all. I know we like to keep the intro short and sweet, but I would like to take this moment and thank those members that turned in a favorite genre of theirs. Maybe Daisy, Tammy Slayton, Dova Khaleesi, Sugared Spite, Patty's Niece, Denny's, House of Jen, Tina Mead, Edith Smith, Tammy Slayton, Luz Crispin, Samantha Place, Revy Hyatt, BX Rose, Kim Walsh, and Cindy Cleveland. While I have acknowledged the members, I will not be labeling which member requested what story. That'll be for you to find out. Or, if one of the members would like to reveal who did what, they're more than welcome to do that. But, let's see how well you all know each other. Another quick note. I laid these stories out in the order that they were received, so some stories may appear back to back to back. There will be chapter markers if you decide to skip over a story. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes, for once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled, Member Requested True Scary Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. So, we have this house. My brother's room is right towards the window of the neighbor's house next door. Their windows are facing each other, so the guy always stares when the window shutters are raised which is why my brother stopped doing that. Literally, constantly living in darkness. However, it doesn't stop at that. The neighbors stare even when we go in the back entrance. We have two entrances to our house. One is on the second floor, which has no neighbors around to see given the second floor is higher than the neighbor house. So he can only see the lower floor of the house. It also has a garden near my room if I go outside, which is also the second entrance, given there's a gate there as well. Either way, if we go outside that garden, the neighbor soon is staring at us, trying to talk to us as well. We never use that garden in general, but I would like to so that I can plant things. However, because he's there staring and it's weird. Mom insisted we just ignore it because he might feel lonely because he does not try to have conversations with us. And that's why he's staring, which I honestly can't understand how she would think this is enough to justify his actions. Anyway, even if we can block him from watching through the window, it's a different thing blocking him from looking at the garden. His second floor of the house is low enough for him to not see the second floor of ours, but high enough to see past the wall of the first floor. You still want to date Kyle? Ruby, you still want to ask Kyle out? After the many times I told you he's a red flag, I can't say I approve of this, but as your best friend, I have to support you. But here are some rules and suggestions you should follow. I recommend listening to all of them. Number one, I recommend asking him out on a Friday. That's when he's less stressed out and more relaxed. And trust me when I say this, you don't want to be near him when he is stressed. Number two, Ask him out at school, specifically when everyone is going home. That's so if he rejects you, you won't be that embarrassed of it due to no one watching. Number three, ask him out with confidence. Don't look scared. If you do look scared, he might think you're weird and reject you. But 
Here's what to do based on how he responds. 3A. If he rejects you, that's a good thing. Sorry if I sound rude, but it's the truth. Don't try to befriend him afterwards. He will think you're weird and probably bully you. You don't need these messages anymore. But if he likes you back, refer to Rule 3B and keep reading. 3B. If he likes you back, that's bad. But congratulations for you. Don't try to kiss him or hug him yet. He doesn't actually like you yet. He's just testing you to see if you're worth dating. Number four, he will be the one planning the date. You be the one choosing the time. He would choose out of three locations and those locations only. Each location is what you should do. Number four, A, the beach. I suggest the date being around 4 to 6 p.m. If it's too early, he might get pissed that it's too bright out and take his anger out on you. You don't want that. If it's too dark, he'll drown you. If he thinks you're weird or never liking you in the first place, if not, you're safe. 4B, the park. I suggest that date time being around 2 to 4 p.m. If it's too dark, he'll probably ditch you or make you lost if he thought you were weird and he never liked you in the first place. If not, you're safe. 4C. A restaurant. I recommend going there at 12 p.m. That's when it's not too early or not too late for restaurants. He can't do anything to you if he thought you were weird. He'll just tell you he doesn't like you without sugarcoating things. 5. He won't sugarcoat anything. So during your date, he might insult your looks, but if you're offended in any way, he'll just call you sensitive and make fun of you. 6. He will make very dark and offensive jokes during the date. He thinks that's normal for some reason. If you want him that bad, laugh along with him or or else he'll be offended. 7. Don't tell him ways to fix himself. Examples. There's a stain on your shirt, your hair is messy, etc. He will get offended and totally pissed. 8. If he offers you a bunch of red roses, take them with gratitude and keep them, you know, if you want to. This shows that he thinks that you have potential. 8. If he really offers you one rose, different colored roses, especially yellow, or a different type of flower, take them with gratitude, but don't keep them. This shows that he doesn't like you, so I recommend throwing them away. 9. Put effort into your outfit. If you don't, he will get offended and insult you. This lowers your chance of y'all getting together. 10. If he asks you to come over to his house, don't. That's the least place you want to be at. Just refuse politely and he won't be mad. If you accept, I'm sorry, but there's nothing I can do. How did I make these rules? It's because he dated 32 girls from school. Half of them gone missing. Ruby, you have a chance to consider dating him. But if you still want to ask him out, I wish you the best of luck. Your best friend, Rose. Psycho Sam, the Horrorcore Murders of Richard McCrowski. What is Horrorcore? Horrorcore is a subgenre of hip hop that emerged in the late 1980s and early 90s, known for its horror elements and its macabre and explicit lyrics about disturbing concepts like violence, murder, the occult, and psychological distress. It shares themes with horror films, dark literature, urban legends, and true crime. 
Despite the controversial content, the vast majority of artists and fans enjoyed the genre as a form of entertainment and self-expression without engaging in violence or criminal behavior. Some notable hardcore artists include pioneers such as Eshem, Insane Clown Posse, Grave Diggers, as well as contemporary acts like Tech Nine, Necro, and Brother Lynch Hung. But there is at least one notable exception. In September of 2009, a 22-year-old amateur horrorcore rapper who called himself Sicko Sam would bring his terrifying lyrics to life in a savage and inexplicable quadruple homicide. What was it that drove Psycho Sam, whose real name is Richard McCrowski, to transform from a seemingly ordinary young music lover to a cold-blooded killer? The answer likely lies in a convergence of factors, a troubled personal life, battles with mental health, and a fascination with the darker realms of art and culture. They called him Psycho Sam. Richard McCrowski was born on December 26, 1988, and grew up in Hayward, California, a suburb of San Francisco. Insistently bullied for his weight and red hair, McCrowski struggled to make friends as an adolescent and instead took refuge in an online community of horrorcore fans. From behind the veil of the internet, the normally shy and awkward young man took on a role of Psycho Sam, a murder-obsessed psychopath with a penchant for gore. In his song, The Voice, McCrowski raps, quote, I love the sight of a body that's rotten and decayed. It's what I think about when I'm stalking my prey, end quote. It was through his online persona and minor celebrity in the world of horrorcore that McCrowski met 16-year-old Emma Niederbrock, a fellow fan of the genre. The two struck up a friendship but that eventually turned into a romantic relationship. Richard's Trip to Virginia On September 6, 2009, roughly a year after first striking up an online relationship with Emma, McCrowski flew from Castro Valley, California to Richmond, Virginia to meet her and attend a music festival. It was said that upon seeing Richard at the airport, the teenage girl was disappointed with her online boyfriend, quickly losing interest in him. The confident, boisterous Psycho Sam that Emma had become infatuated with was, in reality, a shy and insecure 20-year-old who struggled to make connections with others outside of the virtual world. Despite his lack of spark, Richard still accompanied Emma, her parents, and her friend, 18-year-old Melanie Wells, to Strictly for the Wicked, a horrorcore music festival over 600 miles away in Detroit, Michigan, which the group had planned to attend. Attendees at the festival report seeing both Emma and Richard who were recognizable members of the horrorcore music scene, but nobody recalled seeing the two together at any time. In fact, one of Emma's friends, horrorcore rapper Razakil, recalls a conversation she had with the teenager in which Emma claimed that Richard was creeping her out. But nobody could have imagined what Richard would do to get back at the girl he believed had brought him across the country only to reject him. After the concert. After the concert concluded, the group returned to the Niederbrock home in Farmville and planned to spend a few days hanging out at Emma's house before Richard and Melanie returned home. But upon their trip to Farmville, McCrowski's anger and confusion about his relationship with Emma only continued to fester. Believing he and Emma were in an exclusive relationship, Richard was upset to discover that his supposed girlfriend apparently wanted nothing to do with him anymore. In the early morning hours of September 14, 2009, Richard McCrowski used a ball-peen hammer to murder Emma, Melanie, and Emma's mother. 
Deborah Kelly, who were the only occupants in the house, despite joining the road trip to Detroit, Emma's father, Mark Niederbrock, did not live in the family home because he was divorced from Deborah. Each victim was bludgeoned in their sleep and were in incapacitated so quickly that none showed any defense wounds. However horrific, this violence was only the beginning of a series of bizarre events that preceded Mikrowski's eventual arrest. The spree continues. 200 miles from Farmville in Inwood, West Virginia, Thomas and Kathleen Wells were worried that they hadn't heard from their daughter for a few days. Repeated calls to Melanie's cell phone went unanswered, and nobody was picking up the phone at the Niederbrock house. So, on September 16th, the day his daughter was set to return home, Thomas drove to Emma's house and waited outside for over seven hours before eventually giving up and driving back home. The following morning, Kathleen called the Farmville police and asked for them to conduct a welfare check. When they arrived, they made contact with Richard, who told them that the women were at the movies. It's not known why the responding officers did not investigate further, but because the welfare check was for an 18-year-old adult, the officers were not able to continue their questioning or insist on entering the property. After getting no answers from police, Kathleen called Mark Niederbrock, who lived nearby in Pamplin, Virginia, and asked him to check on the house in Farmville. Mark assured her that he would drive down there and call her when he found out what was going on. But Kathleen would never hear back from Mark. Police discovered the gruesome scene. When Kathleen could not get a hold of Mark on September 18th, she again called the police and convinced them to return to the house. Just after 3 p.m., officers arrived at the home and made entry through the front door, which Richard had left unlocked. As soon as they opened the door, they were immediately hit with a foul odor of decay and discovered the bodies of Emma, Deborah, Melanie, and Mark. How Richard was caught. In the early morning hours of September 18th, Richard had driven a Honda sedan into a ditch, and an officer arrived with a tow truck to assist him. When asked whose car it was, Richard told the officer that it belonged to his girlfriend's father. In actuality, he had stolen the car from Mark Niederbrock shortly after murdering him. The police issued him a ticket for driving without a license, and the car was impounded. During his conversation with the police and tow truck driver, he mentioned that he was driving to the airport to catch a flight to California. Later that day, when the responding officer heard the investigators were looking for Richard, he immediately shared that the young man was planning to fly out of Richmond, which helped investigators in their search for their suspect. In the early morning hours of September 19th, Officers apprehended Richard McClowski, who was spending the night in the airport's baggage claim area while waiting his flight the next day. On September 20, 2009, the day after he was arrested in connection with the quadruple homicide, Richard McClowski pled guilty to two counts of capital murder and two counts of first-degree murder. In exchange for pleading guilty, he was spared the death penalty and was ultimately given four life sentences. What Richard Confessed to His Lawyer After his arrest, Richard confessed to his lawyer what happened at the Niederbrock home in Farmville. Around 3 a.m. on the morning of September 15th, Richard first killed Melanie in the downstairs living room. Then he snuck upstairs and bludgeoned Deborah. Finally, he crept into Emma's bedroom and killed her as well. Richard then remained inside of the house with the three bodies of his victims until September 17th. On that evening, Mark Niederbrock entered the house to check on his family and was blindsided by the young man with a wooden splitting maul. After slaughtering Mark, Richard 
decided that he couldn't remain in the house and dragged Melanie's body into Emma's room before fleeing the scene in Mark's car. The killer, who provided a motive for the murders, explained that Emma was his target because she had made him feel rejected, and he chose to kill the others to leave no witnesses. Was the music to blame? In the wake of this horrific act, the media was quick to question whether Richard's obsession with horrorcore rap was to blame for his crimes. One of the most prominent voices in hardcore rap to participate in this conversation was Mars, a horrorcore rapper from Pittsburgh, California. Whenever these inexplicable acts were committed, many blamed transgressive media like horror and action movies, violent video games, or profane music. However, there is no meaningful evidence to support a casual link between violent media and acts of violence. And horrorcore is a genre enjoyed by millions of functional, well-adjusted people across the globe. Richard Makrowski committed his quadruple homicide because he was a deeply disturbed man who had endured a life of ostracization and ridicule. And when the only girl who had ever expressed interest in him was repulsed by him when they met in person, Makrowski lost control and went on a kind of killing spree he had frequently fantasized about in his songs. Richard Makrowski created a world of fantasy in which he portrayed himself to be a dark, handsome, and powerful rising star in a horrorcore scene. But when he finally met his internet girlfriend in real life, the awkward and socially inept man did not live up to the image he projected to her. And just as he had been rejected throughout his entire adolescence, Richard was again shunned by the only girl who had ever expressed a remote interest in him. Richard is currently incarcerated at the Green Rock Correctional Center in Chatham, Virginia. Though he has refused to give interviews to the media, in an interview given by one of his former soulmates, it was revealed that Makrowski is remorseful for his crimes and does not discuss them with pride. The former cellmate who shared that Mikrowski is not popular in prison and is mostly ostracized, although he stated that Mikrowski had select weird people that he hung out with. Remembering Emma, Deborah, Melanie, and Mark. The Niederbrock family enjoyed the wide circle of friends in their hometown. Deborah was a professor of sociology and criminal justice at nearby Longwood University and Mark served as a pastor at a local Presbyterian church. Despite separating, they remained close and both parents played an active role in Emma's life. Emma, in turn, enjoyed a rich social life, performed well in school, and was looking forward to a bright future. Melanie Wells was a young woman who was moving forward in her life after dropping out of high school a few years previously. She was studying hard to achieve her GED and living with her loving parents who were instrumental in helping police capture Mikrowski before he left Virginia. The horrific manner of their deaths and the callous cruelty of Richard Mikrowski should not overshadow the joy they brought to the lives of everyone who knew them. Okay, listeners. I'm sure a lot of people have heard this next crime, but I have never actually narrated this heinous crime. So if you have heard this one and are just tired of listening to it, you can use the chapter markers to go ahead and skip ahead. Those who want to listen to it, tuck in, and get all nice and warm. This will be a story that will pull your heart out and also make you furious at the same time. It's a tough one to get through. But here we go. Chris Watts, A Father's Depraved Crimes On the afternoon of August 13, 2019, Nicole Atkinson and her teenage son drove over to their friend, 
Shanann Watts' home in Frederick, Colorado, after the pregnant mother of two missed a work meeting and an OBGYN appointment that morning. It was unlike Shanann to be difficult to reach. The direct sales representative for several multi-level marketing brands, she was tethered to her social media accounts, regularly posting pictures and responding to direct messages. Shortly after noon, Atkinson called the Frederick police to the residence for a welfare check and also contacted Shanann's husband, Chris, to inform him of what was going on. He immediately left work, arriving home shortly after the police had met Atkinson outside. When the officer and Atkinson entered, they found no sign of Shanann or either of their young daughters, Bella and Celeste. However, they did find Shanann's car in the garage, as well as her cell phone and wedding ring, which piqued the interest of investigators. A picture-perfect family. Those who followed Shanann Watts' various social media profiles saw a picturesque home life in the quaint suburban Colorado town of Frederick. She had two young, beautiful daughters, Bella, who was four, and Celeste, who was three, and had just announced that they were pregnant with a boy named Nico. These stories also feature her 33-year-old husband, Chris, who was often shown playing with his kids, helping Shanann around the home, and modeling Thrive Patches, which he sold as part of her work for multi-level marketing brand, Layville. However, behind the scenes, cracks were forming in the once strong bond that Shanann and her husband had shared. Chris was focusing more on his job as an oil field operator for Anadarko Petroleum and spending a lot of time in the gym, working out in less time with his children. Shanann even shared these concerns with her friends, complaining that her husband was giving her little to no affection and that she was afraid that he was having an affair. Vanish Without a Trace The FBI and Colorado Bureau of Investigation quickly opened an inquiry into the disappearances of Shanann and her two children. Officers combed through the home looking for clues, and neighbors were interviewed to find out if they had seen anything out of the ordinary. A next-door neighbor shared surveillance footage that captured Chris backing his truck into his driveway and garage at around 5 a.m., which Chris explained that he did it in order to load up necessary equipment from that day's work on a remote oil site. However, no CCTV footage from any neighbors showed Shanann or her children leave the property. Although CCTV footage from the Watts' family doorbell camera showed Shanann entering the home the night prior to her apparent disappearance. Investigators were confident that Shanann, Bella, and Celeste never voluntarily left their home. And as investigators began probing into the life of Chris Watts, they discovered a strong motive for murder. The Interrogation of Chris Watts after finding no evidence that Shanann and her children left on their own and spotting no signs of struggle or forced entry, police immediately shifted attention to Chris Watts, who had by then given interviews with multiple local news stations pleading for his family to return. However, in the interrogation room, Watts was not able to maintain the steely demeanor he displayed during his television interviews. He maintained that he had nothing to do with the family's disappearance and was optimistic about the return. But when pressed about the details of his relationship with Shanann, Chris began to crack. Understanding that investigators had seized his electronic devices, Chris admitted that he was maintaining an intimate affair with a co-worker named Nicole Kessinger. Together, the two would go on overnight vacations, meet out for dinner, discuss their plans for a life together after Chris left Shanann. However, investigators could see through this ploy to appear forthcoming and ultimately ask Watts to submit to a polygraph test, which Chris failed horribly, according to the test administrator. 
Under mounting pressure from investigators, Chris claimed that on the early morning of August 13th, he asked his wife for a separation. This is when Shanann flew into a rage and strangled both the girls, prompting Chris to respond in equal measure by strangling her. He then claimed that he drove all three of their bodies out to a remote oil site. He buried Shanann in a shallow grave and stuffed his daughter's bodies into industrial oil tanks. Chris Watts takes a plea deal. Chris's story of killing Shanann in response to her strangling their children did not last very long. Ultimately, he pleaded guilty to multiple charges on November 6, 2018, including three counts of first-degree murder, three counts of tampering with a deceased human body, and one count of unlawful termination of a pregnancy due to Shanann being pregnant at the time of her death. Due to Watts' plea and the wishes of Shanann's family, the death penalty was taken off the table and Chris received five life sentences without the possibility of parole. In later interviews, Watts and his lawyer confirmed that the story he told investigators on the day of his confession was not true. Instead, Chris strangled Shanann after an apparent fight regarding his desire to get a divorce. Chris then collected Shanann's body and drove her out to the oil site with his daughter sitting in the back, unaware of what was happening. On the site, Chris then smothered Bella and Celeste one by one and forced their bodies through the tight hatches of separate oil tanks. Why did Chris do it? Although Watts could never justify the depraved acts he committed against his family, it is helpful to examine what events may have contributed to the man's ultimate decision to annihilate his family. Of course, infidelity was a significant contributor. Between Bella's birth in 2013 and 2018, Chris had lost a substantial amount of weight and developed a love for fitness and sports, which Shanann could not engage in due to severe chronic illnesses, including lupus. This change in appearance and lifestyle eventually led Chris to develop an interest in his younger and more active co-worker, Nicole Kessinger, who shared his passion and growing want for adventure. Additionally, the Watts family had significant financial struggles, having filed for bankruptcy in 2015, and they were barreling toward a second bankruptcy just three years later. Their financial troubles seemed to stem from living far above their means. From 2015 bankruptcy filings, we know that the Watts' family made around $90,000 annually with Chris earning the majority of the joint income. However, they had a $3,000 mortgage and a $600 monthly car payment on top of nearly $70,000 in credit card debt, student loans, and medical debt. And while we don't know the particulars of the Watts' financial standing in 2018, the fact that the couple was due in civil court on August 24, 2018 for failing to pay their $1,533.80 HOA fee suggests that the family continued to struggle financially. Honoring Shanann and her daughters Though Chris would never speak publicly about what precisely drove him to murder his wife and children, those interested in the case believed that he wanted to restart his life. He yearned to live free from the financial burden of providing for his family and desired to have a relationship with Nicole Kesslinger. However, because of his deranged narcissism, Chris could not simply walk away from his family and instead committed the ultimate act of betrayal by taking their lives. Shanann and her daughters were deeply loved by Shanann's parents, Frank and Sandra Rzuzic, as well as her brother, Frankie Rzuzic, who was also described as her best friend. She looked forward to growing her career and she loved being a mother before her life and the lives of her children were so callously taken away. 
Shanann's family have asked those who want to honor her life to make a donation in her name to the Lupus Foundation of America. What is the most terrifying thing you've seen while driving out on the open road in the middle of the night? I used to live about 45 miles from home. My shift was from 5 p.m. till 3.30 a.m., and I frequently came across terrifying things on my drive home. One night, driving in the worst conditions possible, dense fog, I was in the right lane when a semi came up behind me. She or he settled and at a reasonable distance behind me, and we both continued on for about 35 miles per hour. My eyes were burning from trying to see through the fog when suddenly the highway was filled with deer. I braked as hard as I could, keeping in mind the heavy truck bearing down on my bumper. And as I came into a full stop, I fully expected to get smeared into a paste. To my surprise, the truck was able to stop too, and we both sat there and watched the herd of deer saunter across the road and into the ditch. Another time, I had almost this exact scenario happen on a fog-shrouded two-lane road, except there were no semis and it wasn't deer but a huge cluster of raccoons all heaped together so that they look like a grizzly bear. Part of my route home consisted of a two-lane asphalt road that descended from the top of the bluffs into the bottom of a valley, which I intended to turn. The road then went up to the top of the bluffs and on the other side. One night, as I started down the hill, I saw a strange sight indeed. There, Mirroring my own path into the valley was a brightly illuminated convenience store. It was a building made mostly of glass windows, and it was lit up like, well, like a 7-Eleven on a Friday night. I had to steer my truck to straddle a skunk with really poor timing before I could ever pull over to watch the building pass. There was a man inside it, and he waved at me as I drove by. On another night, I was driving along a two-lane asphalt road, and as I approached, I saw the reflections of the rear end of a truck, but they weren't where I would expect them to be. They were located at what the locals called the fishing bridge, and the truck appeared to be floating over the middle of the river. As I got closer, I saw movement on the bridge, and I soon was able to see that the truck had obviously been driven at highway speed directly into the concrete sidewall of the bridge. I couldn't take much time to assess the situation, but I did see that the cab of the truck had been obliterated, with the radiator about where the truck's bed started. There was a young man lying on the concrete bridge deck while another man, a kid really, hurried to approach my window. He denied any need for assistance. He claimed to have called 911, and he said his friend and the two young women who accompanied them were all fine. Other than his obvious intoxication, there was nothing overtly suspicious about him. So, I decided that I would drive to my nearby home and call 911 myself to verify his story. I did so, and the dispatcher said no call had been received. Surprise! So, I hung up and drove the mile back to the bridge. Lo and behold, there was another pickup truck there, and its driver was trying to talk drunk driver to load the hurt kid into his truck. I put the kibosh on that deal. I made DD give me his coat, which I used to cover the hurt kid, and then we all waited for the police. I found out later that the hurt kid had a broken hip. DD got a DUI, of course. I'm surprised nobody got killed.
I used to work permanent nights. One night, we often had sickness at the late minute that no one was willing to come in and cover. So, we used to all help out one another. We didn't do it for the praise or for additional money. There wasn't any. We did it because we were colleagues for years and there was no one else. Inevitably, our work was taken for granted. The managers never thanked us for helping them out of this shit. But they also started to assume that we could cover everything, so they made less and less effort to arrange cover for absences. Even planned absences they knew about in advance. One night before work, I came into work and received a shitty email complaining about staff in our department using the computers for other departments. Now, we had our own computers. The only time my department ever used the other department's computer was when we were covering their absence. The email chain showed the other department complaining about us to my manager who sent out an email to all the night staff in my department saying, from now on, do not use the other department's computers. I was fuming because, as I said, we only did it to help out and to stop the other department for having to cover night shift at short notice. But I thought, fine, that's how it is. The very next night, the other department is short-staffed again. The supervisor on that shift asked me to cover the department. I said, no, I can't. I have been told not to use their computers by my manager. The supervisor says, oh, no, that's okay. Um, we, you can use them. I say, no, I can't. My manager told me not to under any circumstances. So she gets the manager to call me the same manager who complained about us and said, for this one shift, you can use our computers, as if she is doing me a favor. So I said, no, I really can't. You aren't my manager. I can't defy my manager's instructions. Because they can't get my manager on the phone, that late at night, another supervisor had to come in last minute and cover the shift. Native American Folklore Coyote builds Williamette fails in the Magic Fish Trap, a legend from the Clackamas Chinook. Coyote came to a place near Oregon City and found the people there very hungry. The river was full of salmon, and they had no way to spear them in the deep water. Coyote decided he would build a big waterfall so that the salmon would come to the surface for spearing. Then he would build a fish trap there too. First, he tried at the mouth of the Pudding River, but it was no good, and all he made was a gravel bar there. So he went on down the river to Rock Island, and it was better, but after making the rapids there, he gave up again and went further down still. Where the William Nett Falls are now, he found just the right place, and he made the falls high and wide. All of the Indians came and began to fish. Now, Coyote made his magic fish trap. He made it so it would speak and say, Nosipik, when it was full. Because he was pretty hungry, Coyote decided to try it first himself. He set the trap by the falls and then ran back up shore to prepare to make a cooking fire. But he had only begun when the trap called out, Nosebik. He hurried back. Indeed, the trap was full of salmon. Running back with them, he started his fire again. But again, the fish trap cried, Nosebik, Nosebik. He went again and found the tarp full of salmon. Again, he ran to the shore with them. Again, he had hardly gotten to his fire when the trap called out. No sabik, no sabik. It happened again and again. The fifth time, Coyote became angry and said to the trap, 
Why can't you wait with your fish catching until I am built a fire? The trap was very offended by Coyote's impatience and stopped working right then. So after the people had to spear their salmon as best as they could. Hello all. Me and my girlfriend decided to head up to Marshall Lake in Flagstaff, Arizona to do some dispersed camping. It was beautiful during the day, but the moment the sun went down, we decided to put the fire out and head into the tent since it was so cold outside. The moment the sun went all the way down, we were laying in our tent and getting ready to get some sleep, even though it was early. Keep in mind, we were in the middle of nowhere with no one nearby, probably one and a half miles from the closest tent we saw. 30 minutes into laying down with me and my girlfriend, we heard two very distinct footsteps right beside our tent. We didn't hear anything walk up, and it was so close, we grabbed our bear spray and decided to poke my head out of the tent to see if anything was nearby absolutely nothing. We go back to our sleeping bags pretty spooked, and then, 15 minutes later, we heard it again, and we decided we didn't feel safe and left. We hiked out of those woods and got a motel. Are there skinwalkers out there, maybe? Because we saw no animal tracks behind our tent, and we know for certain I heard footsteps around our tent. Oh, quick edit. This happened tonight, by the way, and it was a full, very bright moon. I don't know if that makes a difference. I don't know anything about skinwalkers and didn't even begin to believe in them until now. Continuing on to part two and then the final update. We heard someone unloading shots at something at one point during the night. We believe it was from the campers a mile and a half away at the head of the trail. I thought it was odd that someone shot one magazine and didn't shoot anymore. But as we hiked back out about an hour later, they also packed their camp and left as well. We safely got all of our gear and got out of there and home safely. Please, everyone. Be safe camping or hiking around Flagstaff. I grew up in Belgian Europe. Since I was young, I have been with my friends in the Scout. It is mixed in Belgium. We do not have boys and girls apart usually. We start scouts when we are six years old, and then we go through all the groups until we are 18. That is when we become scouts leaders, usually. I am saying this to give you a little background on me and my friends. We are people that I would consider close with nature, camping, and overall just used to a lot. I would not say we were your typical rough outdoorsy lumber type of people, but we can manage outdoors well through a forest. Back when we were around 16 years old, one of my friends invited our group to go wild camping in the forest that we have close to our homes. It is not your average American national park, I wished, with stories of Bigfoot or worse, but it definitely has its own charm and legend. We got a centuries-old tale about werewolves in our forest and a couple of legends about witches. It is not a huge forest, but one can easily get lost if they're not familiar with his trails and all the trees look the same. This being said, to describe in the best that I can, we were very familiar with the forest since we were small children playing in the tree line and afterwards, as teenagers being blindly dropped with nothing but a map in the middle of it, by our leaders. I do not know whether this game is popular in other 
countries in the Scouts, but in Belgium, it is very well known and quite safe, actually. We do not have bears or, until a year back, wolves. And when dropped, we could carry lights, so just in case anyone didn't manage his or her way out, they would get spotted easily by a search party. Again, this is not a national park that is so huge a person could go missing for days. That being said, again, we were very familiar with the forest, and we were all locals from the village nearby. So we started our camping journey with our bikes from the village to the entrance of the forest. And once there, we would continue to the deeper parts of the forest on foot. Since it was an area with lots of hills and very few trails for hikes, the mood was good. It was beautiful, although a bit cold. Autumn evening with few clouds and a beautiful sunset. We decided our way through the forest until we got to a small clearing with some grass and prepared our tents for the night. We made a small campfire. We always learned to be safe, never putting in danger the forest, and ate some beans and sausage for dinner, together with some very tasty Belgian beers. Around 11 p.m., we decided to call it a night, and we each went to sleep in our tents and sleeping bags. Everything seemed like a normal camping day in our forest. Then, suddenly, at around 1.30 a.m., we woke up to the sound of what seemed like drums. A couple of us got out of our tents with our flashlights, asking what was going on. Our forest had always been a quiet place at night, and during the day, the only noise you could hear were the critters. So... You can imagine the surprise of hearing drums in the middle of the night. We were located on a flat area of the side of the hill to have a beautiful view in the morning. And at the other side of the hill, over the top, we saw light and smoke of what seemed like a bonfire. We figured that had to be the place where the drum noise was coming from. So, the ones who had gotten out of their tents decided to just go over there to see what was going on and maybe talk with the people who decided that it was a good plan to be making noise in a calm forest at 1.30 in the morning. We hiked over the hill so that we could have a glance at the people to know who we would be talking to first. We walked about 15 minutes before we could actually see the bonfire. It was located in a small circled clearing with lots of trees and bushes around it. We crouched towards the bushes and the tree line to get a good look of what was going on, and that is when we saw the people with the drums. A couple of them, I can recall a group of five or six, sat around the fire playing the same tune on the drums the entire time. And another group of people was dancing around the bonfire. Although I say dancing right now, I mean people making weird, unnatural movements, almost as if they were having spasms. And honestly, the best way to describe it is bodies contorting. The people dancing around the circle were wearing suits. A first glance would make it look like people dressing to be one with nature. A second glance would make it look like pagan suits, almost like the original celebrations of Halloween. This was when we realized that whatever these people were doing, whether it was some sort of gag or seriously some sort of ritual, we would be better off if we did not confront them. So we decided to back off and go back to our camping spot as quietly as possible. Once there, we started to wake the rest and tell them what we had seen. We packed up that same moment and left to the entrance to the forest, got on our bikes, and all went back home. We have since still frequented the forest, both for scouts and in our free time with friends and family and we have never seen this circle of people again. However, it stuck with me ever since, and I will never forget how we felt out of place in the forest for the first time in our lives. 
it is the first and luckily the last time that we did not feel welcome in our own forest. This is one of many stories that I have from working night shift at a laundromat in a bad area, and it's definitely the freakiest. So, for context, my mom took a job years ago at a local laundromat because we knew the owner and needed the extra money. I was around 10 when she got the job, and she allowed me to come with her because she would give me a little allowance for helping her do some tasks. I ended up going with her, and every night for years, and as I got older, I mainly went to make sure my mom was safe because I worried about her. We regularly dealt with angry customers refusing to leave, most of which were drunk or high, and we had to call the police a few times. My mom was always worried about me tagging along, but I insisted, and to this day, I still can't say I regret it. A lot of good came out of it, mainly the work experience, and that made up for how intense it could be. I have a lot of interesting stories from that time, but this one takes the cake for the most horrifying, and it took place when I was about 12. Being the young and dumb kid that I was, I designated myself the job of chasing people off when it was closing time. We would have people parking behind the building pretty regularly, so I would walk to the side of the building and start yelling that they were now trespassing, and I'd call the cops if they didn't leave. I feel that this is important to bring up because I now realize that I let any shady person hanging around the building at night know of my presence, and that's a dangerous thing to do when you're only a 12-year-old girl. I was blissfully unaware that anything could happen to me until one night when we showed up to find that the door lock had been broken. My mom had unlocked the building that morning, so it wasn't like this was a break-in attempt since it had been unlocked all day. We were a bit shaken up, but my mom texted her boss to let them know about it and just told me to tell her if I saw anyone pull up. After about 30 minutes, I finished my few tasks and sat down to draw in my sketchbook. I had barely been sat down for a few minutes when I heard the door swing open, which startled me because normally people just knock when they see the, very obvious, close sign. My mom noticed it too and yelled out that we were closed. I heard an older man's voice respond, explaining that he had just come in to use our drink machine. We normally let people in to use our snack and drink machine, so my mom told him he had to wait a few minutes and went back into the closet to grab something. I was sat maybe seven feet away from the drink machine, so I heard him walk up, but didn't really pay much attention to this. I continued to draw until I started getting the feeling that someone was watching me, and I realized I didn't hear this guy put any money in the drink machine. I nervously glanced to my left and saw a tall man in his mid-sixties staring right at me with a big smile on his face. I jumped a little, but forced an awkward smile back at him and directed my attention back to drawing. As soon as I did this, I heard what sounded like shuffling, and when I looked over again, he was closer. I didn't know what to do, so I tried to just not look at him, but every time I would look away, he would shuffle closer. His body was still facing the drink machine, but his neck was craned in my direction, and he wouldn't stop smiling and staring. I began shaking and panicking, and my eyes were darting back and forth between him and the closest door when I tried to plan a fast escape. I went to reach for my knife in my bag because I couldn't even imagine this man's intentions and quickly realized that it was not there. I had left my knife at home when I needed it the most. And yes, I was petrified. 
I decided to just stare back at him, despite being terrified and trembling violently. And after what felt like an eternity, he suddenly broke eye contact and yelled to my mom to have a good night before turning around and walking out. Relief hit me instantly, and I tried to calm myself down after what had just happened. I thought I was finally safe and started to get up to go splash some water on my face when I saw him sit down on the bench outside. Panic and dread hit me like a brick and I sprinted into the closet to hide. I filled my mom in on everything and she told me to run to the car and she'd get between me and him and pepper spray him if needed. I did as she told me and ran to the car and as I passed him, he stood up and began walking towards the car. My mom yelled at him to get away from her car, and his reaction was to try to calmly start a conversation about the make and model of her car while staring right at me. She ignored him, hopped in the car, locked us in, and started backing up as quickly as she could. I dug down in my seat, but could still see the man standing there, and I know he could see me because I watched as he lifted his hand and waved goodbye before walking around to the back of the building and disappearing into the darkness. I felt sick. I couldn't sleep that night, and I never dared set foot anywhere near that back of the building again. So. I guess that was my lesson learned. Creepy old man smiling. I hope we never ever meet again. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these members picked true scary stories. I would like to take a moment and give a very special shout out to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Sugared Spite, Samantha Place, Colt Stonewolf, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Chrissy Elias, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita B, Dova Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Luz Crispin, Patty's Niece, Denise S, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for your continued support of Back to Ashes, because if it weren't for you, I wouldn't be here and neither would the channel. I deeply thank you. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please stay safe out there and take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.